So um, after uh, uh, using this formula, NP equals NI squared, to calculate the electron and hole concentration, the things we're going to talk about today are um, more about carrier concentration, more about uh, uh, the behavior of, of electrons and holes in semiconductor materials. How do electrons and holes move through the lattice? What ultimately develops the resistance of a semiconductor material? So in practice, uh, the intrinsic carrier concentration will generally be given to us. Uh, for silicon, it's 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per centimeter cubed. That's the intrinsic carrier concentration at room temperature. Okay, this is easier to deal with than calculating NC and NV and having to calculate NI each time. Okay. That being said, it's important that you understand that the uh, NI is a function of NC and NV. It's also a function of the temperature. There's an exponential dependence on the temperature. And there's also an exponential dependence on the band gap. Okay. This explains why in the earlier slides, if we bump up, jump up here, we saw that uh, the intrinsic carrier concentration was increasing with temperature as we go from right to left in this graph. And you could see that the different materials with different band gaps, the large band gap material had the lowest intrinsic carrier concentration. The smallest band gap material had the highest intrinsic carrier concentration. This relationship is exponential to the band gap as well as the temperature. <clears throat> so these relations can also be, uh, uh, um, these are also useful relations. N0 is equal to Ni e to the EF minus EI over KT, and P0 is equal to Ni e to the EI minus EF over KT. Okay, these formulas are all deriving from these earlier formulas uh, that we found. They're just in a, in a slightly different form. Now, uh, what's useful about these formulas is that it, it allows you to go between the energy band diagram and carrier concentration. Right, so if you ha if I were to give you the energy band diagram and tell you the position of the Fermi level, then you should be able to use these formulas to figure out what the carrier concentration is. Conversely, if I give you what the electron concentration is and you can ca calculate the whole concentration, you should then be able to use these formulas to draw the energy band diagram. Okay. Last time in class, we talked about the fact that the position of the Fermi level that tells you whether you have an intrinsic n-type or p-type semiconductor. What happens if the Fermi level is close to EC? What type of semiconductor do we have? We have n-type, right. If it's close to EV, it's p-type. And what if it's right in the middle between EC and EV? That's the intrinsic semiconductor, right. The position of the Fermi level will tell you what the carrier concentrations are. These formulas allow you to do that. And we'll be doing an example of this. Yes? What if it was evenly built with um, P-type and N-type uh, dopants? And it, was, it, was, it still rests in the middle, right? If it's, um, evenly, if it's evenly doped, we ended up, we, we talked about this really briefly at the end of class last time. You can use this space charge neutrality formula as well as the NP equals NI squared formula to find the electron and hole concentration. This is actually one of the problems in your homework. Once you have the electron and hole concentrations, you can then figure out what, where the, uh, the Fermi level lies. Okay. So once we do an example of this problem, this will help you see what these formulas are used for. If you're given the uh, location of the Fermi level and you want to calculate the electron and hole concentration, these two equations are useful. If you are uh, um, given the electron and hole concentration and want to find the location of the Fermi level, then these two forms of the equations are useful. Okay. Easy to go back and forth between these two forms. It's just a one algebraic manipulation. Some units and constants to remember. Uh, we are going to be using this, these constants kt, kt over q throughout this class. And remember that kT is the units of energy, while kT over Q is in, electro, uh, is in units of electrostatic uh, potential. Let's look at where these things occur. Uh, for this chapter, 
you're going to see this kt pop up quite often. Okay, K is the Boltzmann constant, and T is the temperature. Have any of you seen KT appear in some of your other courses? Yeah. Which ones? Yeah, I'm sorry? The gas laws. Gas laws? Yeah. That's right. In chemistry, you've seen it appear with the gas laws. The Boltzmann constant and the, uh, the temperature, this KT constant has to do with the amount of energy that's contained at a specific temperature. At absolute zero, when T goes to zero, this, this energy disappears. So the KT term has to do with uh, um, the, uh, the energy contained in a system at non-zero, at, at temperatures above absolute zero. So KT over Q, you're going to see appear later in this class. K is a Boltzmann constant. It's 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rds joules per Kelvin. So it's the amount of energy in a system divided um, per unit temperature. Another way of expressing that is in terms of electron volts. Okay, one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Joules and electron volts are both forms of energy. One of the things that always confuses students is that uh, they think electron volt is another form of voltage, electrostatic potential. It is not. It is a unit of energy. One joule is equal to one point. Oh, this is incorrect. Let me fix this here. One electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So, sorry for that. Please do fix that in your notes. This constant Q we already know about, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Uh, KT over Q, which we'll talk about later, this is KT divided by the, uh, the electron charge comes out to 0 0.026 joules per coulomb, 0 0.026 volts. KT over Q is in units of electrostatic potential. We'll be using that later in the course. What we're using right now is this function, this, uh, uh, this product KT, 8.62 times 10 to the negative 5 electron volts per Kelvin. And if we are at 300 Kelvin, if we're at room temperature, then KT comes out to 0 0.026 electron volts. If you remember this number, 0 0.026 electron volts, it'll save you time on uh, exams and quizzes. It's a rule of thumb. This 26 millivolts here is called the thermal voltage. It's used often in semiconductor calculations. The same number, 0 0.026 electron volts, appears in a lot of energy band calculations at room temperature. Keep in mind that these constants are only valid at room temperature. Yes? I'm sorry? Uh, KT, uh, KT over Q and KT, this 0 0.026 number is valid for room temperature. And you can see these from the calculations. We, we use 300 Kelvin here. Okay. It'll go up if we, if we double the temperature, let's say. All right, so let's do an example. In the energy band diagram of silicon, suppose that EF is positioned... 0.3 electron volts above the intrinsic level. What is the electron and hole concentration? What is the doping? And what type of semiconductor is this? So let's try this problem together as a class. So this is a problem where we are given the energy band diagram. So the first thing you do in this problem is draw EC, EV. I also like to put in here in dotted lines EI. EI is the intrinsic level, okay? If the, if the Fermi level is positioned at the intrinsic level, that means you have an intrinsic semiconductor. So in this problem, the Fermi level, EF, is positioned 0.3 electron volts above EI. Okay. We know that the band gap here 
is 1.12 electron volts. And uh, we know that um, the distance from EC to EI is about half of that. So what you're being asked to do in this problem is figure out what is N0, what is P0, and what type, what type of semiconductor. So why don't you go ahead and try this out, it's given the energy band diagram. And then you're asked to calculate the carrier concentrations. So take a few minutes and, and try that. You'll have a problem like this in your homework, too. So if you just uh, get used to doing it now, your homework will go a lot quicker. Where does the 1.12 come from? So 1.12 electron volts is, is the band gap of silicon. Yeah. So in this problem, you're told that it's silicon, so you know that the band gap is this much. Okay, let's go back to the problem here. It's helpful. Uh, these are the formulas that you're going to be using. Has anyone been able to find a relation for, uh, excuse me, find the carrier concentration? Start off by finding the electron concentration. <laughs> 
there any point, uh, any part of the problem that's, that we're stuck on? Yes? Let's, uh, let's go over this, and you've had a chance to try it out. When you find the, uh, the electron concentration, electron concentration is Ni E, and sorry, do exponential of E F minus E I over K T. Okay, so N I is one point five times ten to the ten. And uh, then we have exponential. Now the difference between EF and EI, you were told in this problem that the Fermi level is positioned 0.3 electron volts above EI, so the difference between them is 0.3 electron volts. So the numerator here is 0.3 divided by KT at room temperature is 0 0.026 electron volts. Okay, and do this real quick on my calculator. All right, so this comes out to 1.54 times 10 to the 15th per centimeter cubed. All right, so that's how we find the electron concentration. The whole concentration, how, uh, how do we find that? If we know the electron concentration, how can we find the whole concentration? <coughs> there's, there's two ways to do this, but I'm showing you the easier way. I'm sorry? I know. This is a doped semiconductor. Yeah, the question was, aren't they the same? The answer is no, because in an intrinsic semiconductor, the electron and hole concentrations are the same, but in a doped semiconductor, they are not. So there's two ways to find the hole concentration. What's one of them? Yes. That's right. So what we did in class last time was we used NP equals NI squared. So the P0 is going to be NI squared divided by N0. And this is the preferred way. The other way that you could find it is by using this P0 formula at the bottom here. Okay. Both will give you the same answer. But, um, you know, my preference is the faster way to do this is to use the exponential formulas to calculate one of the carrier concentrations.
And once you know one of the carrier concentrations, use NP equals Ni squared to find the other one. That's the quickest way to do this. All right, so P0 is 1.5 times 10 to the 10. Professor, yes? Did you recheck your Did I make an error? 1.5 times 10 to the 10 times this exponential. Did, did someone get a different number? Maybe we could, OK. Let's crowdsource this. Let's crowdsource the confirmations. OK. Thanks, thanks for letting me know. If, if at any point, like I, I do make mistakes sometimes during lectures, so if, if you're confused about something that doesn't seem right, feel free to let me know. OK. So ni squared is 1.5 times 10 to the 10. We square that divided by the n0, which we just calculated in the previous part. 1.54 times 10 to the 15th. Can someone with a calculator help me out with this? 0 0.46, 1.462 times 10 to the fifth. All right. So another example here, we look at the electron concentration. We look at the whole concentration. There's a huge difference, right? In an intrinsic semiconductor, both the electron and hole concentration will be 1.5 times 10 to the 10. When you, when you make an n-type semiconductor, you have a high electron concentration and a low hole concentration. So this is a case of an n-type semiconductor. This n-type. Right? And then what is the doping? Yep, it's, we doped it with the column 5 element. It's n-type. And what's going to be the doping density? So we want to say nd. So we're doping it with donors, a column 5 element. So we use this, this constant, we use this symbol nd. If it was a p-type semiconductor, we'd use n sub a. So what is the doping density equal to in this case? It's a very easy way to find this. There's no calculations involved. I'm sorry? It's not equal to P0. It's, e it's equal to N0. It's equal to N0. In an N-type semiconductor, ND is equal to N0. 1.5 times 10 to the 15th. Remember the reason for this. In an n-type semiconductor, let's say we put in an arsenic ion here. Every dopant that we put in there creates one extra electron. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, That's why whatever the electron concentration is, 1.54 times 10 to the 15th in this case, it's the same. The doping density is approximately the same. Yes? So since we were given the EF was 0.3 electron volts above EI, we could have said it was an N-type right away, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we knew that from last time in <coughs> class. So good point. Yeah, if, you, if EF is above EI, then, of course, you have an N-type semiconductor. Yes? Good. So any questions on this problem? All right, so it's a simple problem in calculating carrier concentrations. Moving on. We've looked at the temperature dependence of this already. So we've talked about this slide already, so I'm just going to skip over it. Now we're going to look at the temperature dependence in an extrinsic semiconductor. This was intrinsic, what we saw earlier. Now we're going to look at an extrinsic semiconductor. All right. So what we have here is on the x-axis is 1,000 divided by temperature. And on the y-axis, we have the doping density. The x-axis is similar to what we saw on this slide. Okay, It's 1,000 divided by temperature. They do this because it's easier to show exponential relationships in this manner. So the right side of the graph is lower temperatures. The left side <laughs> of the graph is higher temperatures. And it's, a not, it's not a linear graph. 
So at low temperatures, we're in this portion of it. And this is what happens at high temperatures. So we're going to look at each one of these regions here. This graph is showing the electron concentration for an extrinsic semiconductor, a dope semiconductor, at various temperatures. The relationship is a little bit more complex than intrinsic. In the intrinsic semiconductor, it was just, it appeared as a straight line in these types of graphs for an intrinsic. For an extrinsic, there's a little bit more stuff that happens that we have to be, that we have to think about. So at very low temperatures, this is the energy band diagram that we saw earlier. Let's say you dope the semiconductor, but you're at zero Kelvin. By doping it, you introduce this, uh, this energy state, and that energy state is filled with electrons. But at zero Kelvin, there's not enough energy for the electrons to be uh, freed or released from the lattice. In other words, there's not enough energy for the electrons to go into the conduction band. So at very low temperatures, even a doped semiconductor will, will not be conductive. So we're talking about from about 0 Kelvin to about 50 Kelvin. What will happen at 50 Kelvin? What will happen to these electrons at 50 Kelvin, even a, a small increase in temperature? They will go to the conduction band. That's correct. So this is the second part of it. At moderate temperatures, anything above 50 Kelvin to 100 Kelvin, which is you know, 100 degrees below Celsius, there will be enough energy for these electrons to go into the conduction band. And now the conduction band is par uh, partially filled, so this semiconductor begins to conduct electricity. This is the region that we generally operate semiconductors. This is what's called the extrinsic region. Now, another question is, what do you think will happen if we increase the temperature a lot? If we go above, let's say we go above 400, 500 Kelvin. May end up destroying the property of the material or something? It will change the properties of the material. But just looking at the energy band diagram, what do you yeah, think will happen? Come over to the band. Yeah, what was that? Uh, I think surveillance electrons come over to the Exactly. Band, so. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, at, at small temperatures, uh, there's enough energy for these electrons to go up to the conduction band. But at, e at very high temperatures, then the electrons from the valence band, they will acquire enough energy to go to the conduction band. This is the region that we call intrinsic. So at very high temperatures, the electrons in the valence band can jump up to the conduction band. Now, you have the electrons from here. You have electrons from the dopant atoms. In addition to that, you also have dopants. You have, I'm sorry, you also have electrons coming from the valence band. So the, uh, uh, the conduction band is now very conductive because you have two types of electrons in there. And the valence band also becomes conductive because it is also partially filled now. So what ends up happening is that the, the, uh, uh, the electron concentration, this is only showing the electron concentration, by the way. There's a lot more electrons in the conduction band. As a result, this goes way up. What do you think is going to happen to the conductivity of the material? It, it increases, right? So this is one of the reasons why you can't operate semiconductors at very, very high temperatures. All the N regions and the P regions, everything will short out because you have a lot of uh, carriers in the conduction and valence band. It'll start behaving as a metal. Okay, as you know, you know, circuits, if everything behaves as a metal, then you've shorted out your circuit. You don't have a working circuit. All right, so this is one of the fundamental reasons why silicon can't be used in really high temperature applications. For high temperature applications, you actually need large band gap semiconductors so that this effect doesn't happen. For this reason, uh, this is one of the reasons why diamond was being investigated as a, se a potential semiconductor material for very high temperature applications. So if you're working in a, in a factory, inside, a, inside an automotive engine, another material that was being investigated was something called silicon carbide where you have a combination of silicon and carbon atoms. They're both column four elements, right? So they form those tetrahedral bonds. But silicon carbide also has a larger band gap than silicon does. So th those are useful for higher temperature applications where you don't want you know, to prevent uh, the semiconductor from going into the extrinsic zone.
All right, we generally operate our semiconductors in, in this region here. <coughs> All right, now we're going to take uh, uh, we're going to take a step back and talk about what electric current is. We're in the second part of this module now, where we we're going to discuss the movement of carriers. We spent all this time talking about whether carriers exist or not, how many carriers we have. How many carriers we have is only part of part of the problem. And we're trying to determine how conductive a material is. When you're trying to determine how conductive a material is, it's, it's about how many carriers you have and how fast those carriers move through the material. We've talked about how many carriers we have. Now we're going to talk about how, how fast those carriers move through the material. And by the end of the chapter, we're going to get to the concept of electrical resistance. And just to remind you of the fundamental concept, Ohm's law. You guys saw this in your in your physics class. You've seen it in your first electronics class. You, if you put a voltage across a resistor, uh, you get a current. Okay, and the the relationship is V equals I R. V is a voltage. I is the current through the semiconductor, and R is the resistance. So the voltage sources would be something like a battery. It could be a you know a, a voltage source in the lab, and so on. So this concept that you all know so well, Ohm's law. Is, is a type of current called drift current. There's actually two types of current. There's diffusion current and drift current. We're going to be talking about one of those types of current in this module. Diffusion we'll talk about next module. So we're going to be taking a closer look at this basic phenomena of uh, a resistor. The questions we want to answer is this. What is drift current? How does drift current flow through a semiconductor? And what determines the resistance of a semiconductor resistor? So we're going to take a closer look at drift current right now. All right, The resistor is actually a block of material. And that material is partially conductive. That's right. When we put a voltage source over there, over a semiconductor material, the first thing that happens is that you generate, uh, oh, assume that this block of material, we're going to put some dimensions on there, it has a length L. Okay, so you've applied the voltage between one side and the other side. So the length that it has to go through is L, and it also has a cross-sectional area. Okay? And for the purposes of this problem, just to simplify things, in most cases, the, co the cross-sectional area is constant. Okay, a wire, the cross-section is a circle. In the case of semiconductor resistor, it's usually um, approximated by a rectangular cross-section. When you put a voltage source over the resistor, the first thing that happens is that you create a, an electric field. The applied voltage generates an electric field. And the electric field is pointed in this direction. The electric field is pointed from positive to negative. Right, that's the whole, the, the, the whole thing, the, the whole purpose of the voltage source is to create an electric field. And that's what's, what ultimately pushes the charges. Now, a relationship for this that you may or may not remember from physics is this: uh, the electric field is equal to the voltage applied divided by the length of the resistor. The units for electric field is volts per centimeter. So the next thing, the next concept here, is that a conductive material contains a charge density. We can call that Q. And the units for charge density is coulombs per centimeter cubed. Right? The number of charges in, in a certain volume, per, that's why it's called a vo a charge density or volumetric charge density. If you took out a centimeter cubed of the material, how many charges would you have in there? The more charges you have, obviously, the more conductive the material is. That's why we've been spending all this time calculating the number of charges we have. We'll get to that and we'll, we'll incorporate that into this model in just a second. So um, right now we're going to assume that we have an n-type semiconductor. In an n-type semiconductor, you have a lot of electrons, very few holes. So the, the electrons are the charge carrier. So, all right, so just imagine that we have all these charges scattered through the material. The number of uh, Q is the number of charges per centimeter cubed. So what's going to happen if, we, if those charges are placed in an electric field? 
they get pushed in a certain direction, right? Which way are those charges going to move? They move from negative to positive. That's correct. So in this case, the electric field propels electrons in a direction opposite the electric field. Positive charges move in the same direction as the electric field. The average velocity at which the electrons move is equal to is the velocity v is equal to the electric field times the mobility. So the electrons are moving in this direction from left to right. Now, intuitively, just think about this: the more electric field you have, the faster, the more force you have that's pushing the electrons, right? The faster the electrons will move. Right. So this constant of proportionality is called mu. Velocity is equal to mu times the electric field. The more electric field you have, the more velocity you'll have. This constant mu is a constant for the material. That constant represents how quickly the charges can move through the material. That's what mobility is. Mu is called the mobility of the material. In materials where the electrons can move very quickly through the material, those materials will have less resistance. Electrons can move more easily through the material. The mobility is a very important parameter for semiconductors. Uh, semi high mobility semiconductors can ultimately yield faster microprocessors because they have less resistance. If you have less resistances, then if you remember from circuits one, all your, um, all your circuits end up working faster. Remember RC filters, low pass filters? When you, an when you analyze the speed of circuits, every circuit ends up forming a, a low-pass filter. If you can reduce the resistance of that low-pass filter, then you can increase the speed. So the resistance actually comes down to mobility of the material. All right, but let's, I'm getting off topic here. Right now, let's just think about this, that the, the electric field propels the electrons in a direction opposite the electric field. The average velocity is, uh, is given by mu times E, and mu is a property of the material. Next concept, a density of moving charge is called current density. All right, if you imagine a whole bunch of charges moving through here like this, if you take um, the density of moving charges is called current density, J is equal to the number of charges per centimeter cubed multiplied by the velocity at which they're moving. Okay. And we have a relationship for the velocity already up here. So this comes out to Q times mu times E. So this is the density of current that we have. This is given in amps per centimeter squared. You can think about it as sort of a flux. Now the, the current, the total current in the material, the concept that you're familiar with, the current is the total number of electrons passing through a cross-sectional area per second. So the current is equal to the current density times the cross-sectional area. And the units for current is given in amps. So current density is amps per centimeter squared. You multiply that by a cross-sectional area, centimeter squared, you get the total current A. This is drift current. This is the movement of current through a resistor. Uh, now, you can imagine smaller cross-sectional areas will have higher current densities. Right? Um, if you push the same amount of current through a small cross-sectional area, you'll end up having a higher current density. That's what causes the material to heat up, by the way. So this is the concept of current through a material. Now, I like to think about it like this. If we were to um, look at a cross-sectional area like this, like this blue region here, okay, and we were to count how many charges are passing through that cross-sectional area every second. That is what current is. Coulombs per second. The number of charges passing through that window per second. It's important that you have an intuition of what current is. We sometimes forget. We just think V equals IR. It's the physics of it, we, we want to think about the physics of it for the purposes of this course. All right, there's a similar analysis for holes. Except, as we know, holes move in the opposite direction. They move in the same direction as the electric field. Electrons move opposite the electric field. These are all, the, for, for the purposes of your notes, these are all the units for the different uh, things that we've talked about. 
All right? So this is a closer look at uh, drift current, where Ohm's law ultimately comes from. Now, where do we get the resistance from that? Um, we're looking at the same thing here, same diagram. The resistance is the ratio V divided by I from Ohm's law. So we can solve for the resistance by u and just combining the formulas that we saw earlier. So what, what are the relationships we found? The electric field is equal to V over L. The current density is equal to Q times mu times epsilon. And the current is equal to the current density times the area, which is equal to Q mu epsilon times A. So this all came from the previous slide. We have these three fundamental equations to work with. Now all we do to find the resistance is we, we take the voltage and we divide it by the resistance. Or we take the voltage and divide it by the current. The ratio V divided by I, R is equal to V divided by I. So for the, the V, we take this relation up here. V is equal to the electric field times L. So that's why we have E times L up in the numerator. In the denominator, the current is equal to Q times mu times electric field times A. So we have that in the denominator there. Now notice that the electric field appears in both the numerator and the denominator. E up here and E also appears down here. So these guys cancel out. You're left with L divided by Q times mu times A. Right, so this is a formula for calculating the resistance of a material. Resistance is equal to the length divided by the charge density multiplied by the mobility multiplied by the cross-sectional area. Now think to yourself, this should make sense because, think about this, it, the more the cross-sectional area there is, meaning like the bigger the wire is, the less resistance it is, right? Bigger wire, less resistance. The longer the wire is, the more resistance you have. So that's why length appears in the numerator. Now this has to do with the conductivity of the wire, Q and mu. Mu is the mobility, so the faster electrons can move through the wire, the less resist resistance it is. The more electrons that you have inside the wire, the less, uh, the, the, uh, less resistance there is. All right? So L and A are uh, physical dimensions. They're geometric. They have to do with the geometry of the wire. Q and mu have to do with the properties of the wire itself, the electrical properties of it. <coughs> right? Q is the charge density. Mu is the mobility. Now this constant, we can define a constant sigma. Sigma is equal to Q times mu. This is defined as a conductivity of a material. Q is the density of charges and mu is the mobility. So this Q times mu in this equation, we just denote that by a constant. And every single material has a certain conductivity. You know, gold, for example, is very high conductivity. Uh, silicon, intrinsic silicon has a much lower conductivity, but if you dope silicon, you can get higher conductivity. All right? So we're, we can control the conductivity by the doping. It's also determined by the mobility. Any questions? Okay, so we'll get into scattering uh, after after the break. So, uh, you know, this whole idea of the electrons moving through the material is complicated by the fact that uh, electrons actually move in random patterns. Okay, that's ultimately what slows a material down. As the electrons moving through the material, it collides with different parts of the lattice, and those collisions ultimately slow the electron down. We'll get to that uh, after the break. So let's take a couple minutes stretch break. We can get the presentation ready, and we'll go from there. All right, so let's talk about scattering now. What we ended up with before the break is that we were saying that the electrons are moving through the material. Okay, uh, this, this arrow suggests that the electrons are just moving straight through the material, but the reality is it's not quite like that. When an electron moves through the material, it actually moves in 
a pattern like this where it, it moves in one direction, it collides with something, and the collision causes it to move in a slightly different direction, and then it collides again. And uh, uh, these collisions are <coughs> happening with the lattice. So if you picture an electron moving through silicon, there are a bunch of nuclei around there. There's vibrations in the lattice. We'll get into the details of that in a second. For, but for right now, just know that the electrons are always colliding with things as they move through the lattice, and these collisions slow it down. These collisions are actually present when there's no electric field also. If you apply no electric field to a material, what you see on the left, an electron will basically just be, um, you know, it'll bounce around. Uh, the reason why it's bouncing around is because it has thermal energy. The only way to remove these types of movements completely is to take the system down to <coughs> absolute zero. That's when all thermal motions stop. Remember, thermal motions are described by the Boltzmann, that Boltzmann times temperature, Kt. All right. the, the thermal energy of a material actually is proportional to Kt. So uh, uh, electrons are, uh, just imagine that the electrons are always bouncing around in the material. They're moving due to the thermal motions, and then they collide with uh, elements in the lattice. So the electron goes from here to here. You know, it just keeps on uh, moving around, bouncing and colliding. And so ultimately, it, the average velocity of the electron is zero, because these are essentially random movements. Random motion of carriers, average velocity is zero. If the average velocity is zero, then obviously you get no current. <clears throat> With electric field, you still get these collisions. However, the net movement is, uh, it, it, you have a net velocity, and the velocity is uh, in the opposite direction of the electric field. So imagine the, uh, the electron starts off at point one. It is, uh, it is accelerated in this direction by the electric field. It always moves opposite the electric field. Then it collides with uh, the second element here. It keeps on going in this direction. Then it collides with the third element. It keeps on moving in this direction. And then some collisions could even cause it to move in the opposite direction. Okay. But you see that the net movement between point 0.1 and point 0.6, the net movement is still in the um, in a direction opposite the electric field. So you have a net movement, net displacement, and you have a net velocity. So what we saw in the previous slide, the velocity of the electron in centimeters per second is equal to the mobility times the electric field. So the mobility has to do with how much collisions there are. What, what do you think will happen to the more collisions there are, what, what do you think will happen to the mobility? It'll decrease. That's right. So whenever the electron's colliding a lot, you get the mobility of the material goes down. So, uh, some of you have talked about graphene and nanotubes during in the class presentations this semester. Some of the interesting things about those materials is that they have a high mobility. The reason they have a high mobility is that the electron can move through the material with very few collisions compared to standard silicon. In a solid material, electrons collide with uh, two different types of things. Lattice vibrations, that's called lattice scattering, or the impurities, the impurity atoms, like the boron or arsenic, the, those ions in there, that's called impurity scattering. We'll go and have sli one slide on each one of those later. Scattering slows down the net velocity of the electron through the lattice when the electric field is applied. So the less scattering you have, the higher the mobility. It's all captured by this uh, constant mu. The mobility describes the ease with which the electron or hole moves through the material. The higher the mobility, the faster an electron or hole moves through the lattice. As you can imagine, the more scattering is present, the more slowly an electron moves through the material, therefore the lower the mobility. And this is an equation for the mobility here. All right. Actually, in the in the next slide, I actually have a derivation of it, which you're not going to be expected to remember, but I think it's good to kind of go through that. But this is the equation itself. I want you to think about the intuition behind this equation. Think about the electron as a particle with effective mass. All right. The way that I actually, actually like to think about this is in terms of like, a, you know, if you're playing a game of pool, right? You think about the collisions. You know, you're moving the, the cue ball in one direction, but the cue ball hits 
hits another um, hits another ball, or in even better to think about is that the uh, the cue ball hits the wall, and when it hits the wall, it's going in a different direction. Now, uh, imagine that uh, the uh, the pool table was tilted. Okay, so you have the force of gravity. The gravity is always pulling the cue ball in one direction. But if you hit the cue ball against the wall, it's still going to deflect, right? That cue ball is going to have the effects of the deflection, the effects of the collision, and it's going to have the effect of the gravity pulling it down. In the case of the electron, you have the effect of the electric field that's moving it in one direction. It's always causing it to move in a certain direction, but it's also colliding, and those collisions can cause temporary deflections in the electron. So think about the electron as a particle with effective mass. It has a certain mass. And that, that, that mass is always colliding with other particles. So the, uh, uh, the velocity of that uh, electron is changing. And then the electric field starts to accelerate it again. Right. Now compare a heavy particle and a light particle. What's going to move through the lattice faster? The light particle. Because the collisions, what's happening is, you know, from a mechanic standpoint, the collisions are changing the momentum. Right? The heavier particles have more momentum. They have more inertia. So, you know, when they collide with something, they lose their momentum. They lose the inertia. It takes more energy to get those things moving at a velocity again. So, if you were to compare, you know, if you had the same electric field on two different particles with different masses, the the particle with the less least mass or I'm sorry, the particle that, that's the most massive will actually travel slower through the lattice. This equation encapsulates that idea. The mobility is equal to, this is mobility, this is denoted mu n because we're talking about the mobility of electrons. If we're dealing with the mobility of holes, you'd say uh, mu p. p is the subscript for holes. Mobility is equal to q is the charge. T is the mean time between collisions, and this mn star is the effective mass. The more massive a particle is, the more the effective mass is, the mobility will go down. On the numerator here, we have the mean time between collisions. The less frequently an electron collides with something, the faster it's going to move through the lattice. This is why this appears in the numerator. Just a small note here, this is called the conductivity effective mass. It's different than the density of states effective mass used in the calculations of NC and NV. You don't really need to remember that because this is not something that we went into the details of uh, in this class. But just know that it's, it, that it's different. The effective mass of an electron is different than the effective mass of a hole. Electrons move faster through the, through the lattice than holes do. Okay. This is because a moving electron is just an electron moving from place to place. A moving hole is actually the, move, the, the movement of an incomplete bond as it moves through the lattice. That happens slower than electrons do. So that's encapsulated by the fact that the holes have a larger effective mass and they end up having a lower mobility. Usually different by a factor of about two in silicon two or three, and then in other materials it can be even more than that. You'll see when we talk about the mobility of electrons and holes. This slide is a quick derivation of mobility. I'm going to go through it relatively quickly, um, just from a mechanics standpoint. <coughs> Each collision, so what we think about, the electron is moving through the lattice, but it's undergoing these collisions, as you see here. It keeps on colliding with things. So we can actually go back to just like uh, uh, physics, like the, the basic concepts of physics and collision, momentum, and we can actually get at what the mobility is. This is how we think of it. And I've sort of like distilled this down to a few essential concepts. Let's say the electron is colliding with uh, the nucleus of a silicon. All right? The electron collides and then it moves back, you know, bounces off. We start with this assumption that whenever the electron collides, its momentum is reduced by this much. Remember, momentum is mass times velocity. P is equal to mv. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. 
if we take the, the if the velocity of the electron is in this direction and then this the collision causes it to lose all of its momentum then this delta p is equal to mass times delta v the mass of the electron stays the same but it experiences a reduction in the velocity so this delta v we can assume that in our in our uh, analysis we're just assuming that this velocity drops to zero Okay, so each collision reduces the momentum by uh, m times delta v. So we call that delta p. Now, a fundamental concept from mechanics, and, and for any of you who've had classes in mechanical engineering, force is the rate of change of momentum. Okay, so force is equal to dp dt. Yes? So your assumption is the si's velocity is zero, right? Because when you collision, the mass. The, in, in this analysis, the mass does not change. The velocity changes. In elastic collision, but I think it is more elastic when you bump at each other to the mass change. If this you have elastic collision, where I mean, in elastic, where the where the what you call the mass is actually combined to form a new mass, then mm -hmm. you have the mass change. But yes. I think in this case, it's just like elastic collision; they bounce on each other. So yes, yes, yes. The mass will be the same. That's correct. We're starting with this uh, idea of an elastic collision, right? The mass of the electron is not changing; it's just bouncing off. You know, it's colliding with something, so it loses velocity. There's a change in velocity, so that's where the delta v comes in. There's no delta m. So the force—you can think about force as the rate of change of momentum. All right. Now the tricky thing about this analysis. If you try to think about it in terms of like one collision and then you look at the momentum reduction there, you try to analyze all the mechanics of the force in that single collision, you know, the, what's happening in this material is actually the electrons constantly colliding with things. Right. So that's why we do this type of analysis where we say the force is a rate of change and the scattering force is a time average force exerted by the lattice on the electron. The electron's always colliding with it. So what you can think about is is that the, um, uh, think about it this way. Think about a car that's going on a highway, right? There's a certain drag force associated with the car, right? The drag force is proportional to the velocity of the car. The faster the car is going, the more the drag force is going to be. This is a similar with the case of electrons. The faster the electron is moving through the lattice, the more collisions it's going to undergo, and therefore the more, uh, more the scattering force will be. So I like to think about the scattering force as sort of a drag force that's slowing the electron down. The, this, the drag force is proportional to how fast the electron is going. So um, the way that you can derive the scattering force, a frictional force, I guess you can think about, is the time average force exerted by the lattice on the electron. So it, the way you calculate it, the scattering force is equal to dp dt, the rate of change of momentum divided by the time. This can be calculated as a momentum change per collision multiplied by the collisions per second. You think about the units here. Momentum change per collision, that's delta, that's P, okay? That's mass times velocity, and collisions per second is one over time. So this gives you the change in momentum over change in time. That's a scattering force. This is equal to MV because you assume that the momentum change per collision <coughs> is mass times the velocity here, coming from this, uh, this analysis that we just did up here. 1 over t. Now, t is the mean free time. That is the time between collisions, the average time between collisions. Now, the electron's always colliding. The delta t between collisions is not always the same. It's actually it's random, right? It's stochastic. There's actually an exponential distribution. We won't talk about that. But... The, the average time, okay, we're just trying to do a simple calculation. The average time between collisions is called the mean free time. So 1 over t is the collisions per second. Now the third part here, like I said, considering, consider the scattering force as a drag force slowing down the moving electron. It opposes the electric force that's pushing it forward. You put the voltage source on there, you create the electric field that's pulling the electrons in one direction. The scattering force is slowing it down. It's trying to it's exerting a force in the opposite direction. It's the same thing as a car moving through, you know, the drag force exerted on a car moving through a highway, or the frictional force if you're pushing a box, you know, across the surface. 
uh, so set the two forces equal to solve for the velocity. If you're doing a mechanics problem and you have a drag force, you set the drag force equal to uh, the force that's propelling it forward. You set the two forces equal to each other, and you can solve for the velocity. That's what we're doing here. Scattering force is equal to the electric force. The scattering force is mv divided by t, which we just found here. The electric force is q times e. This is a formula from electromagnetics. Electric force is equal to Q times the electric field. The amount of charge you have multiplied the amount of, by the electric field. And so if you solve for V, you get this simple relation. Velocity is equal to Q, the charge, times the time between collisions, divided by the, the mass of the particle, multiplied by the electric field. And this is exactly the formula that we have here. Qt over m. The velocity is equal to this factor multiplied by the electric field. This is the mobility mu, Qt over m. Right? It, ar it arises from just a basic analysis, and basic mechanical analysis of a body just being pushed in one direction but undergoing multiple collisions that slow it down. So now that we have a relationship for mobility, let's talk about the specific mechanisms that are slowing down the electron. The first one is called lattice scattering. There's two types. So it's la this one's lattice scattering. Next one's impurity scattering. In any solid material, the atomic lattice vibrates at temperatures above zero Kelvin. These are called thermal vibrations. The only way that you can bring those to zero is to, is to use liquid nitrogen to cool the system down to absolute zero. And indeed, a lot of physics experiments do that so that they can avoid the noise that, that's caused by these thermal vibrations. The vibrations I've sort of illustrated here with these orange lines. Imagine, imagine the nucleus and the lattice vibrating at, uh, and if you can imagine the vibrations, those vibrations change, the, those vibrations can interact with the electrons. If we think back to the Schrodinger equation, we said that the structure of the lattice determines where the electrons are. It determines the behavior of the electron. Well, if the structure is moving, if the structure is vibrating, that's going to change what states that the electrons can be in. Uh, you know, one way you can kind of think about it is imagine if, the, um, uh, if some of the atomic structures move, then that's going to change what the orbitals look like, right? The orbitals are going to move slightly. So that orbital structure can, will change how the electron propagates through the lattice. So lattice scattering is induced by the thermal vibrations. The electron collides with uh, the vibrating lattice, causing it to change direction, as you see here. Now, lattice scattering has a temperature dependence. The scattering rate is proportional to temperature to the power of 3 halves. The idea is that more thermal vibrations you have at a higher temperature. A higher temperature means more vibrations. More vibrations means there's more probability that the electron will collide with some of these vibrations. So at higher temperatures, you get more lattice scattering. What does this do to the mobility? Reduces the mobility. Right? So at high temperatures, the mobility goes down due to lattice scattering. The next type of scattering is impurity scattering. I haven't drawn the vibrating atoms in here because this, this type of scattering actually has to do with charge. So suppose we have a, an n-type semiconductor. Right? In the n-type semiconductor, we have a bunch of silicon atoms here. And then somewhere in the lattice, we have the arsenic ions. Right? Whenever I draw these two-dimensional diagrams, by the way, just so you know, um, the actual lattice of silicon is 3D. We saw that in module one. It's that diamond lattice. I'm drawing these in 2D just so you can conceptually see some of these things. Okay. So suppose we, uh, we dope the silicon n-type, and so everywhere in the lattice at different parts of it, there are these arsenic ions. Now, how does the electron interact with this arsenic ion? The arsenic ion, remember, it's a column 5 element. It has an extra electron. And when the extra electron leaves, the arsenic ion has an effective positive charge. This is why it's called an ion. We talked about that before, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. That was in last lecture. So how does the uh, uh, electron interact with that? 
this blue dotted line is if that um, is the trajectory that the electron would travel if that ion were not present. So what happens here is that the electron, as it's moving by, it sees a positive charge. It's attracted to positive charges, right? Those are the Coulombic forces, the Coulombic interactions. So the electron still has uh, momentum going this way, moving this way, but the, the fact that it also has a, a charge that's attracting it to this ion here causes the electron to deflect off in a certain direction. Okay. If the electron were traveling at really, really low velocity, what would happen is that the electron would, could, in, in principle, it could just collide directly with the ion. You know, positive, the positive and uh, negative charges you know, would come together. But the electron is actually moving at a sufficient velocity so that it doesn't actually just fall in here, it actually goes past it, it's just deflected. Now, uh, a, a kind of a cool example of this that NASA uses these types of principles when they're um, sending the spacecraft off in different trajectories. I, I don't know if you guys have heard about this before, but you know, when they, uh, when they send the Voyager spacecraft off, in, uh, they often send it towards one planet and the gravitational force of the planet like kind of like hurdles it off in a different direction. It slingshots the, the satellites. So uh, this is not the exactly the same principle because the electron is actually losing energy as it goes by this. But the, the fact is like that, uh, you know, when a satellite slingshots off a planet, the planet's gravitational force attracts that satellite, but the satellite is traveling at too fast a velocity to actually get pulled into the planet. It actually just keeps on, keeps on going, but its trajectory is deflected. It's a similar kind of idea here. You have some momentum that causes the electron to go this way, some attractive force pu pulling it this way so the electron gets deflected off. In the, case of the, uh, um, in the case of the satellites, it actually gains energy. The satellites actually get accelerated. That's how they get them to, to go at like these really, really ridiculous speeds. Um, I, I, I don't remember what some of them are, but uh, like the Voyager spacecrafts, things like that, those are among the fastest moving things that man has ever made. Pretty, pretty cool. Anyway, <clears throat> so let's look at this impurity scattering phenomena. It's due to Coulombic forces. It has a dependence on doping. Obviously, the more of these ionized impurities that you have in the lattice, the more, the de more deflections are going to happen, the higher the probability of impurity scattering. So as a result, impurity scattering becomes more significant at higher doping concentrations, typically greater than 10 to the 15th or 10 to the 16th per centimeter cubed. When Na or Nd is greater than this amount, you start to see more of this impurity scattering effects. The mobility goes down. This also has a temperature dependence. As I mentioned, at lower temperatures, you have low, lower thermal vibrations. So the electrons, you can think about it as the electrons moving slower. If the electron is moving slower through the lattice, it's going to be more affected, it's going to be more deflected by this charged particle because it has less inertia to help keep it moving forward. So when the electrons are moving slower, they are more affected by impurity scattering. And this is why the temperature dependence, the impurities, the scattering rate is proportional to temperature to the negative three halves. Lattice scattering it was proportional to temperature to the three halves, and in this case is proportional to negative three halves. So when the electron is traveling slower, it's spending more time near the dopant ion. So there's more time for it to be deflected off in a different direction. More deflection means more scattering, lower mobility uh, at, at low temperatures. So what's interesting is that we have two of these phenomena, like one is dependent on t to the 3 halves, the other phenomena is dependent on t to the negative 3 halves. So I'm jumping ahead one slide here, but uh, this is why you end up having this temperature dependence of mobility. So if we plot temperature on a log scale, this is the x-axis, mobility is on the y-axis, we'll see a relationship that looks something like this. At very low temperatures, your mobility is, is small because of impurity scattering. As we increase the temperature, the mobility goes up like this. It reaches a high point somewhere around, for silicon, it's you know the best cases somewhere around room temperature a little bit less than that, a little bit less than that. Once we go above that, that optimal uh, temperature, then the, uh, the mobility goes down due to lattice scattering. 
so there, uh, for materials like silicon, there actually is an optimal temperature to to operate that microprocessor. Now we don't, you know, we usually don't get down to these temperatures, right? But what what does happen in the real world is often microprocessors can get into this region, right? If you know, typical room temperature is 300 Kelvin, right? If you were to go to 400 or 500 Kelvin, like 200, let's say 200 Celsius, what do you think happens to your microprocessor? Well, some of some of you have. Are any of you gamers? <coughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> so what what happens if you overclock your microprocessor and you're running at really high? Huh? They burn out. They lose all the blue smoke. They lose all the what? All the blue smoke. Blue yeah, smoke? Magic smoke. smoke. There's smoke in every circuit. Like the blue smoke that comes out of it is blue. There's a magic oh. smoke in every circuit. Mm -hmm. Blue smoke. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> that could be some of the materials that's on top of the silicon that, that's, that's burning off. But uh, let's look at this from like a fundamental standpoint. When, when you're at high temperatures, mobility is going down. Okay. If the mobility goes down, the resistance, what happens to resistance? Okay, resistance goes up. What happens if you increase the resistance of an RC circuit? I'm sorry? An RC circuit, a resistor and a capacitor. Let's draw this out here. Um, you know, a transistor consists of a bunch of trans. Uh, a, a microprocessor consists of a bunch of transistors that look like this, and um, this transistor might drive another transistor like this. Okay. This is an inverter, and this might be driving another inverter, and so on. Um, what I'm trying to show you here is that um, everywhere. For those of you who have taken digital logic course, this is the equivalent circuit. These transistors here are driving current to um, move the voltage of this gate higher or lower. Um, this can be modeled by an equivalent circuit, an R and a C. The R here is determined by the mobility of the semiconductor material. RC circuit, what happens to the, the corner frequency of an RC circuit as you increase the resistance? Corner frequency, Fc. Or say, let's let's just say the time constant. The time constant is the amount of time it takes for this capacitor to charge. The tau is proportional to <coughs> Rc. Right? In fact, it's two pi Rc for those of you who remember from circuits one. So, as you go to higher temperatures, mobility goes down due to lattice scattering. Resistance goes up. When your resistance goes up, this time constant goes up. So what is that going to do to your microprocessor? It slows down. Microprocessors actually slow down at high temperatures. Some microprocessors actually have this feature. When it detects that the temperature is getting too high, it'll automatically bring down its clock rate. From like, you know, if, you know, if you're at 3 gigahertz, it'll bring it down to 1 or 2 gigahertz when it's detecting high temperatures. A lot of microprocessors have this feature built into it. Uh, the opposite is also true. Like if you want to drive your microprocessor at, at clock speeds above what it's rated for, which is what gamers often do, you know, it might be rated for two or three gigahertz. You might drive it a little bit faster than that. Maybe you'll drive it 10% higher than that. You can tell your computer to do that. But if you do that, you have to make sure that it's properly cooled. And so a lot of gamers have like all these fancy cooling circuits to make sure that their microprocessor stays cold. In high performance computing, often they will cool the microprocessors with, uh, with various types of coolants in order to maintain uh, the low temperature. It's all to avoid lattice scattering. The National Science Foundation was sponsoring huge efforts on how can we build, how can we build um, fluidic channels and other elements into microprocessors to help cool them better. Microprocessor heating is becoming a huge problem now because there's so many transistors on the chip. There's so many circuits in that chip in such a small area, it's actually generating a lot of heat. And heat basically causes this problem, lattice scattering. It kills the performance of the microprocessor. So how we can keep chips cool is a problem that the government's looking at. Huge companies that are operating data centers like Facebook and Google are looking at that thing. It all comes down to this fundamental principle here. <coughs> 
So lattice scattering is more important at high temperatures because there's more vibrations in the lattice. Uh, impurity scattering is more important at low temperatures because electrons are traveling slower. They have more time to interact with the impurities, so they're more deflected. We'll start next class with, actually, let me just finish this up since we have two minutes. It's just one slide here. The dependence on doping concentration, um, this is due to impurity scattering. Remember I was saying that with the impurity scattering, the doping dependence, once you get above 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 16th, then this starts to become significant. So if you look at germanium, silicon, uh, gallium arsenide, all these three materials, you notice that once you get to a doping density of 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 16th, then the mobility starts going down. These charts are showing mobility versus doping at 300 Kelvin. This is a log scale, so you have low doping on the left, high doping on the right. That's the x-axis. The y-axis, you have the mobility, centimeters squared per volt second as the units. So mu n, once it gets to 10 to the 16th, it starts to drop. Same thing with mu p. The, mu n is a mobility for electrons. M mu p is a mobility for holes. Electrons always have a higher mobility than holes because they have a lower effective mass. It has to do with the way that electrons move through the lattice compared to the holes. And you can see that mu n is larger than mu p in all three of these materials. The ratio, however, is different. You look at gallium arsenide, mu n is much larger than mu p. There's a much larger ratio. This all has to do with the, the crystal structures of the materials and how those carriers move uh, through there. Okay, so we've finished talking about mobility. We'll start here next time. This chart just shows the mobility of various semiconductor materials that you can use for your homeworks and also get a sense for um, you know, how, uh, you know, which materials may be useful in certain applications. We'll touch on this next time and then get into more material.